Okay. So thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak at the Global Development Institute. I'm really speaking on behalf of the research team today. Uh, so this is Nithya Natarajan and Laurie Parsons, both researchers in my department, so at Royal Holloway University of London. Sepek Chan, who is a lecturer at the Royal University of Phnom Penh. And finally, the photographer, whose photographs you're going to see today. So this is Thomas Christoph Valetti from the Rayum Collective in Cambodia. So the study is officially titled Blood Bricks, Examining the Climate Change Modern Slavery Nexus in the Cambodian Construction Industry. And as Tom uh, kindly introduced, it's co-funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and the Department for International Development. And it's finally ending this August. So our research explores the complex and articulating factors that lead to indebtedness and later debt bondage in the Cambodian brick-making industry. As part of this endeavor, we highlight the catalyzing impact of climate change upon deepening rural insecurity. In doing so, we embed kiln workers within the broader trajectories of change and relations of power from which they emerge. In referring to blood bricks, we wanted to capture the overlapping and compounding vulnerabilities of environmental fragility together with the precarious lives and livelihoods of people working in the construction industry in Cambodia. So in this seminar, we want to give you a very broad sense of our findings from the study. The research was undertaken full time between September 2017 and April 2018, and we've just for, um, come back from a follow-up trip in January of this year. So first, we undertook semi-structured interviews with 51 brick kiln workers across brick kilns in the environ of Phnom Penh, and these were supplemented by 31 further qualitative interviews with other actors, including kiln owners, union leaders, former kiln workers, residents around the kilns, Buddhist monks, and these were all used to triangulate the data and provide additional perspectives. Second, a total of 308 quantitative surveys were conducted in three villages. So these are villages that comprise high levels of outmigration to brick kilns. All brick-sending households were surveyed in each village, and then a randomized sample of other households was also sampled. These surveys were further supplemented by qualitative interviews with a sample of labor-sending households and other figures in the village. And finally, geospatial data on the locations of household and agricultural land was collected by SAPEC, as well as irrigation features such as wells, waterways, was collected and added to this data set. The third element of the methodology was uh, more detective style, if I can call it that, and that included the tracking, quite literally in some instances, of the bricks to Phnom Penh. This included documentary analysis of the supply chains of the buildings which we found to be using what we call blood bricks. Our findings were released in London in October 2018, and this was specifically time for Anti-Slavery Day to raise awareness of debt bondage and what we saw as a knowledge gap in its links to climate change. The same month, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, released this well-known report arguing that if global warming was limited to 1.5 degrees as opposed to 2 degrees, this would reduce negative impacts on ecosystems, human health, and well-being. I guess what our blood brick study shows and brings to the fore is the significance of climate change in quite subtle ways in the here and the now. Moving from the city to the kiln and finally back to the rural villages once called home, our published report, and um, here's a hard copy, but you can um, download from uh, our website, um, it traces how urban development is built on unsustainable levels of debt taken by rural families to struggling to farm in one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world. Cambodia's status derives from not only the heightened climate risks it faces in the form of floods and droughts, but also the lack of capacity to adapt and respond. It is estimated that around 70% 
of the rural populace rely on agriculture that is highly sensitive to climate change. Rainfall patterns have altered significantly in the last 100 years, with severe droughts and floods increasingly common. In trying to repay loans taken on to cope with the destructive impacts of climate change on agrarian production, families from rural villages across Cambodia are forced to leave their homes to live and work, often as entire families, in brick kilns from which many will never escape. Blood bricks embody, we argue, the converging traumas of debt-bonded labour and climate change in our urban age. So if you could take a look at this infographic. Um, this is a, a visual representation uh, which kind of shows the complexities of the phenomenon that we're looking at. So accounts from those speak to the multiple and structural factors that facilitate debt bondage, from the impacts of climate change, absence of state support for agriculture and rural development, lack of social protection or affordable and accessible health services, the largely unregulated microfinance sector, corruption and weak rule of law, and finally the operations and ethics of large um, and global corporate companies from construction to fashion. And I'll explain that link a bit more later. The path of exploitation faced by brick makers is exacerbated then by climate change, but is rooted in poverty, inequality, and Cambodia's neoliberal turn. The seminar that we've put together that follows traces this path uh, through the stories of participants and are accompanied by Thomas's photographs. And at the end, if I have time, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Sustainable Development Goals, notably Goal 8 and Goal 13, to offer some final reflections. So to understand the experiences of multi-generational workforces of adults and children trapped, trapped in debt bondage in Cambodian brick kilns, we need to journey from the kiln to the construction sites of Phnom Penh and explore the domestic and foreign investment supporting Cambodia's literal ascent. Cambodia is in the midst of a construction boom, the building of office blocks, factories, condominiums, housing estates, hotels and shopping malls are pushing its capital city upwards. Cambodia's economy over the last few decades has been widely celebrated for its robust growth since 1995, with GDP growth rates uh, between 7 and 7.5% 7 from 2011 to 2016. Sustained increases in foreign capital investment combined with a proliferating domestic capitalist elite are forging new projects across Phnom Penh. From, 20, um, sorry, from 2006 to 2016, the construction sector grew by an average of 17%, and it represented the largest contribution to growth in 2015. Recent indications suggest that the, the rate of growth in the sector might be slowing down, yet in 2017, Cambodia saw a 36% increase in imports of building materials, and a 27% increase in approved construction projects. Construction is thus lauded as an important driver of growth and an, a contributor of growth creation to cite the World Bank in 2018. But this vertical drive into the skies and the country's status as one of Asia's fastest growing economies hides a much darker side to Phnom Penh's ascent. Building projects demand large quantities of bricks, and there is a profitable domestic brick production industry supplying them, an industry which profits from exploitative labor practices. Our research tracked bricks produced by kilns using debt-bonded labor to a range of prominent developments across Phnom Penh, and in our report we directly set, cite eight of them, including the Elysee development here. Also one park, uh, this is located on the former Bangkok Lake. Uh, this was the site of a protract protracted and contested forced eviction, perhaps the most well-known in Cambodia today, and this was the subject of my past research. And here, the peak. Uh, this is actually my own photo, hence of lesser quality than Thomas's. Uh, this is from January this year. So this is a development which is built by a Cambodian company in collaboration with a Singaporean corporation which is publicly traded on the Singaporean Stock Exchange. A number of international institutional investors 
have stakes in this latter company. These are Norwegian, UK, and US registered. As such, global capital was found to be benefiting from debt bonded labor in Phnom Penh brick kilns. So bricks offer, we argue, an important yet overlooked vantage point from which to understand people's lives behind the domestic and global growth story of Cambodia's capital city. The demand for bricks and the kiln workers who make them, however, are not the only inputs which supports Phnom Penh's vertical ascent. The story of the bricks that enable this boom begins in the paddy fields to the north of Phnom Penh. Bricks begin as mud in the earth of rural Cambodia. Kiln owners initially purchase small parcels of land in villages known to have good clay soils and then proceed to build their land reserves in these villages such that small farmers are forced to sell their land. The environmental degradation of brick kiln making starts here with the excavation of fertile soils. And this also leads to the displacement of farmers, many of whom are forced to work in the brick kilns thereafter. Clay is excavated by laborers and brought in trucks to the kiln where it's piled up in huge mountains ready for use. Brick kilns also require huge volumes of wood, often illegally logged from rapidly diminishing forests. And the unloading of wood typically takes place at night to evade authorities. But using wood is increasingly expensive. During our time in the kilns, we made a surprising discovery. We found offcuts from the garment industry being additionally used to fuel the kilns. Hundreds of thousands of tons of, are wasted in the design and production process before clothing even reaches the customer. When garments are cut as patterns, for instance, as much as 15% of the fabric can end up on the cutting room floor, or in this case, in a dump, and then onto the kiln. Garment offcuts that are discarded by factories are transported to this large dump specifically for garments on the outskirts of Phnom Penh, which we um, did work in last year, but which we have just revisited in January this year. En route to this dump, trucks are intercepted by middlemen who purchase the garments, and in some cases sell them to brick kilns to be used as fuel. And it's a huge, huge landfill of clothing, and I hope this gives you a, a sense of scale. As this photograph shows, label and br labels on brick kilns include those of international fashion <coughs> brands. And this is something that hasn't changed um, in the nearly two years of us doing this work. So returning in January, there were new brands, but similar, similarly very well-known ones um, that we ourselves may well be wearing. In, urban, in peri-urban Phnom Penh, a visible indicator of there being a brick kiln is this thick column of black smoke towering into the sky above. In the 2018 State of Global Air report, um, it found that in India, which has a well-known brick belt across the central regions of the country, smoke emerging from kilns is the sixth highest cause of respiratory-related deaths in the country. No similar analysis exists vis-a-vis -vis the Cambodian brick industry. However, the palpable health impacts upon kiln workers were reported in our research. Clothing commonly contains toxic chemicals, including chlorine bleach, formaldehyde, and ammonia. Heavy metals, PVC, and resins are also commonly involved in dyeing and printing processes. And this is a picture of the brick kiln uh, with this kind of oozy black tar coming out of it. Brick makers resp report respiratory problems from breathing in the pre-consumer waste. Our research therefore adds further weight to criticisms of fast fashion, including its negative environmental impact, the use of toxic chemicals, and increasing levels of textile waste. The UK Select Committee report, which you have here called Fixing Fashion, was published literally a couple of days ago. I'm just going to read you an excerpt. While incineration of unsold stock recovers some energy from the products, it multiplies the climate impacts of the product by generating further emissions and air pollutants that can harm human health. Incineration of clothes made from synthetic fibers may release plastic microfibers into the atmosphere. 
Climate change emissions will have been generated when the products were created and more CO2 will be produced when they are burnt. So this month um, we've been doing some exploratory work. Um, as a human geographer, this is very new to me, using a particulate matter reader. Uh, so looking at air quality, so PM 2.5, which measure, measures for very fine particulates, and PM uh, 2.10, which is coarser particulates. So here you can see a reading taken from this vantage point of 999.99. Um, for both, this is classed as hazardous to human health. With PM 2.5, these are particulates which are small enough to be uh, breathed directly and um, very deep into the lungs. When exposed to these measures, measures sorry, of PM 2.5, one may experience the following effects according to medical documentation. Shortness of breath, eyes, nose and throat irritation, excessive coughing and wheezing, diminished lung function and lung disease, diminished heart function, sometimes resulting in a heart attack, asthma attacks and death. And here you can see a picture of a brick and worker chucking some garments into the fire. Interviews on one such garment burning kiln highlighted these adverse health impacts felt by workers. Nguyen, a female worker, told us, in the past we used to burn firewood, but the boss uses garment fragments now. This impacts people's health and causes various illnesses. Burning fabric here causes more fumes and also impacts the local people around here, especially those working here. Health problems are coughs, colds, flus, mostly caught by children. Others even have lung inflammation or respiratory infections. And I should say on this point that people live and work on the kiln site. So it's not just that they're working there, they also live within these toxic conditions. Thus, the burning of garments connects the individual consumer, perhaps even in this room, with the making of blood bricks and their associated social and environmental harms. Unsafe machinery, extreme temperatures, brick dust and overworking kilns contributes to other reported health issues. And these are both chronic and fatal, bleeding nostrils, uh, lung inflammation, respiratory infections, vomiting, dizziness and fainting, physical exhaustion and limb amputation. And these were all things that were reported um, to us in our work. As Petit told us, my 14 year old boy ran to play with a water buffalo and then came here and put his arm into a machine. It was cut off. I had to borrow more money. The owner, so the factory owner of the kiln, gave me 1,400 US dollars. He cut this from my piece rate. Work in Cambodian brick kilns is unsafe in different ways, contributing to the aforementioned health issues. So these machines are notoriously unsafe, presenting a danger of serious industry and limb loss um, in the case of accidents. Although these machines are gradually being phased out in the industry, they're still uh, extremely commonplace in Cambodian brick kilns. And um, the kiln owner, takes no responsibility for any injuries that are incurred on site in terms of prevention or trying to deal um, with um, treating kind of arising conditions, apart from lending more money and deepening uh, the situation of debt bondage. Thus, with insufficient means to meet daily needs in most cases, every illness necessitates, as I've mentioned, a loan from the kiln owner and thus deepens the bond of both the sufferer and the family. As Chantu explained, for example, after six years working the brick kilns, my health was getting worse and the debts were getting worse too. I was often sick and we took loans from the boss to get a surgery for my stomach. Nowadays, my children still haven't paid off the debt. As such, the research shows that debt bonded labor comprises severe exploitation that is corporeal and renders workers unfree to leave kilns and alter their circumstances in the vast majority of cases. The physical wear and tear takes its toll then, the result being, as Marlis puts it, the more I'm sick, the more I owe. The length of time also spent living and working on the kiln means that aging is a significant issue in the capacity to repay the loan. As Bisset notes, you see, teacher, before when I had enough strength, I could do all kinds of work, especially when five or six trucks came to transport the bricks. I carried the bricks to fill the trucks. But now I'm getting old, and 
going on working here, but not like I did before. I do so to survive in exchange for food. I have nowhere to go at all. All I can do is to do small things for food. Since I started working in the kiln, I've led a life of hardship. Unrelenting and extreme working conditions also mean that some workers experience premature death, and this was not uncommon um, in the testimonies of workers that we met. For workers who transport bricks in and out of the kilns and who fire them, the overwhelming danger is heat. So this is a, as a result of dehydration. As a humid, subtropical country, heavy work is a danger to any type of worker if inadequate hydration is not provided. To compound this, kilns reach extremely high temperatures at their peak, and the bricks are rarely allowed to completely kill, cool before the workers have to go in and uh, collect them and bring them out. Thus, the risk of dehydration and heat exhaustion is extremely dangerous. This contributes to a wider body of literature in occupational health studies, which is documenting the adverse impacts of health upon workforces globally. As the infographic suggests, some workers turn to coping mechanisms, such as excessive alcohol consumption, which obviously have adverse health and social implications. Furthermore, some female participants um, reported an upscaling of domestic violence encountered since moving to the kiln. So our research sought to understand why anyone would enter such a situation. The truth is nobody wants to. The brutality of uh, life in brick making is renowned beyond the kilns. Rural Cambodians from villages without migration to the kilns are well aware not only of the difficulty of the conditions on site, but also the one-way nature of the journey. Yet those who enter the brick industry have little choice to do so. Almost invariably, they are the victims of a variety of factors conspiring to drive them into unsustainable levels of debt in rural areas, and from there to the kilns. Climate change is a, a key reason for the accumulation of debt. Among those surveyed in the three sender villages, 76% reported increased droughts, 73% reported increased changes in rainfall, and 83% reported increased variations in temperature, and this was all over the last five years. The impacts of climate change upon indebted smallholder farmers have the potential to be devastating as varied climates lead to poor harvests, thus blighting the primary form of collateral against which any loans may be given. Uh, to quote the Asian Development Bank, high vulnerability to climate threats is therefore one of the three main obstacles to agricultural growth in Cambodia. And our evidence certainly foregrounds this as a key factor in exacerbating rural debt. Attempting to deal with these conditions, farmers increasingly depend on uh, highly costly private irrigation and pesticides, significantly increasing the costs of farming and the need to take on debt. The high levels of borrowing involved in irrigated farming place farmers at the mercy of the natural environment. Pests, floods and droughts may not only spell um, the end of a crop, but the end of rural life and the start of a journey to the brick kiln. Indeed, for those who are just about coping in these difficult conditions, nobody is more than one illness away from debt bondage. Although moneylenders have long been present in rural life, increasingly easy access to unregulated credit has seen families with ailing members accrue vast medical debts in recent years. Public facilities in Cambodia are often uh, very distant and difficult to access for those who need them most. And, and this leads many to rely on very expensive pharmacies and private clinics, or to make do at home, as this photo shows. Health inequality is therefore a key issue in Cambodia's rural areas, and health problems in the family are a key factor driving people into unsustainable levels of debt and ultimately debt bondage. Kravan is a female um, brick worker in Phnom Penh and has worked there for two years since medical expenses forced her to move. She recounts her story. I used to stay at home and grow rice, but when my husband became sick, I sold all my farmland. After that, I had no choice, besides working in the brick factory. My husband had a stroke uh, from high blood pressure. Half of his body has been paralyzed, and since then I have become the breadwinner for my family. 
The incidence of single um, household health of a single household health issue pushed Crovan into selling her land, and despite this, she still accrued debts from her husband's health care expenses, which led her to a life on the kiln. The path to the kiln, then, is paved with climate change, poor state support for agriculture, and poor public health coverage. It is in this context of structural precarity, of needing to find work, that leads uh, smallholder farmers to the brick kilns in question. The reasons that families enter brick kiln work are therefore varied, multiple, and often compounding. Yet underlying the wide ranging scenarios is poverty and inequality. As Sre, a mother of a debt bonded worker, explains, we were poor as we had no house, no farmlands. When there were rains, we stayed inside a small hut, but without any walls, because everything else got flooded. We just sold some chickens. Whenever it rained, everything uh, got flooded. We were given 25 um, heirs of farmland, each after the Pol Pot regime. However, some families have more than 10 children, yet only 50 hours of farmland, a mother 24 hours, and a, a father 24 hours. The le they left the lands untouched because they had no buffaloes or cows, so they went to work in the brick kiln for a living. And one hour is around 100 uh, square meters. A key axis of inequality is also gender. Reflecting a broader national trend, female-headed households in our study were more likely to be landless. 25% of female-headed households possessed agricultural land compared with 50% of male-headed households. Female-headed households are also 25% more likely to contain brick workers than male-headed households in our sample. More broadly, although brick workers or potential brick workers are not necessarily a class apart from other villagers, they are overall worse off uh, to those who have no connection to the brick kilns. And um, you can see this from the chart here. So this is evidence across all asset categories, from televisions to transportation, brick workers have less of everything. Furthermore, this is reflected not only in assets, but also income. Brick workers earn less on average, possess less agricultural land, and have fewer productive assets of all types. 74% of non-brick workers in the household possess um, agricultural land, compared with 56% of brick worker households. This lack of assets means that brick workers are not only poor, but also vulnerable. Assets, as many of you will be aware, are key to responding to shocks, meaning that people with more assets are better able to withstand uh, the impact of climate change, for example. Those who possess mechanizing harvesting equipment are both able to collect their crops uh, rapidly and at a lower cost and hire out their services to others. Those with fewer assets, by contrast, are only ever one illness, drought, or infestation away from the kilns, a vulnerability which is exacerbated by climate change. But as you'll see, uh, I haven't really talked much about high interest loans so far, so I'm going to turn to that. So a key driver of rural debt is undoubtedly the proliferation of a deregulated credit industry from the early 2000s onwards. So microfinance in Cambodia uh, began under a humanitarian NGO-driven model in the early 1990s designed to provide opportunities for demobilized soldiers to start up small-scale enterprises as a means of social reintegration, um, as many of you will know, following decades of war. The microfinance sector in Cambodia became increasingly commercial from the late 1990s onwards, in keeping with global trends. Local microfinance organizations were consolidated into a national body, and the shift for, from a for-development to for-profit uh, approach has become more ingrained. The rise in coverage is also quite astounding, with the number of clients served by microfinance rising from 300,000 in 20, 2005 to 1.6 million in 2013. The consolidation and expansion of Cambodia's microcredit institutions, so MFIs, in this period and beyond, is cited as a development success. 
Yet expansion was predicated upon the loosening of restrictions with regard to loan amount, the remit of who is able to procure a loan and interest rates. Thus, the apparent success of microfinance, ex sorry, microfinance expansion in Cambodia can otherwise be read as the dissemination of risky loans to vulnerable debtors. As Milford Bateman argued in 2017, I quote, the microcredit sector has acted to disadvantage, exploit, and increase the poverty and vulnerability of Cambodia's poor, and has thus acted as a significant headwind, mitigating against Cambodia's overall development and poverty reduction prospects. This precarity was made starkly evident through the difference in levels of indebtedness between BRIC households and non-BRIC um, sending households, with the former holding an average debt of 1,380 US dollars and the latter 814 US dollars. Putting this into broader context, uh, gross national income per capita in Cambodia in 2016 was 1,140 US dollars. Among bonded labourers in kilns, the pattern was almost without exception. Small farmers that incurred rural debt borrowed money from a kiln owner to repay lenders. In return, movers work their, sorry, um, workers moved their entire families to work off the debt bond. As such, indebted small farmer, smallholder farmers become debt bonded kiln workers. As Kosal explained, we have to work here because of our debt. If not, we would have chosen to leave this place a long, long time ago. This is our unsolved problem because the loan from the kiln owner comes with no interest. If the owner permitted it, all of us would go back home because of our hard work. People generally prefer to rent land to grow rice or vegetables, but in our case, we're in debt, and so we aren't able to do such things. If we had enough money, we would repay the kiln owner the loan. Kosal was forced to sell his rice fields after both his wife and mother became sick simultaneously, and he faced, uh, as I've described before, mounting medical expenses. He grew indebted in the village, and his initial non-farm job working at a salt factory did not pay enough to earn enough to repay the debts that he was taking on. He now owns 4,000 US dollars to the kiln owner. His mobility is severely restricted as a result of these debts. He's unable to leave the kiln and work elsewhere, even in periods where the kiln uh, stops due to the rainy season or erratic rain. And he is therefore forced to increase his borrowing for his family's basic expenses in such periods of stagnation. Um, and here you have a picture of, of where people live um, on site. The work he does is also grueling. Kosal and his wife, Rangsai, perform a range of tasks from breaking up large mounds of fresh clay using hose, manually transporting clean clay into brick molding machines, where clay is pressed into the molds, and then carrying and stacking molded bricks into the sun to dry. Kosal's account speaks to the proliferation of exploitative labor in Cambodia's insecure labor market. Bonded brick kiln workers in Phnom Penh are therefore those whose freedom, wages, and bargaining power are significantly restricted by debt. For many workers, the kiln will become home and workplace until the end of their strength or their life. And this is for a range of reasons, including the, the outstanding loan size to be repaid. The average debt owed amongst the 82 interviewees was 733 US dollars and the highest recorded was um, 5,000 US dollars. The average time on the kiln amongst the 82 interviewees was 8.5 years with the longest recorded duration of an individual interviewed um, at 30 years. In the interview and focus group research that we did, participants understood that running away would likely be futile as they would be caught and brought back to the factory by police, uh, despite it being illegal, um, who would go, um, go back to the natal village and literally bring them back. And instances of so-called runaway workers were certainly not isolated occurrences. And 
I must say that brick kilns are not homogenous spaces. Uh, there were different management practices. Um, in rare instances, uh, workers were allowed to leave the brick kiln. Um, in one focus group, a brick factory was known for having a kind boss who only did good deeds to cite the worker. He would allow um, them to visit local pagodas on holy days, uh, offering them transportation. More commonplace, however, was the denial to leave the brick kiln site. In both interviews and focus groups, participants spoke of factories where only one family member was permitted to leave at one time. In Sapeep's case, her husband needed to be taken to hospital from the brick kiln, and she told us, I had to ask the owner to take my husband to hospital. My mother and children stayed here to assure him that we would not escape from our debt. A female focus group participant also told us of a factory where this practice happened. I quote, if the workers want to go to the homeland, they have to keep the mother at the factory or let the mother go but keep the children. They don't allow everyone in the family to go because they want to prevent runaways. They also have to stay at the factory forever until they have enough money to pay back all the debt. They cannot run away because the bus, will, sorry, the bus, the boss, will print out their photos and post them everywhere to catch the workers. They have no choice. The boss is too strict and too cunning. Also, if they want to go to their homeland, they will have to take on more loans. In other words, the mobility of some family members is predicated on the immobility of others. Not only this, but to visit their homelands often, requiring, often requires entering into more debt to pay for transportation. As such, short-lived mobility heightens workers' exposure to long-term immobility. Even in situations where a family member had died through an accident on site, it was reported in a series of cases that against family wishes, the funeral was not allowed to take place off site. As Sray Mom reports, the boss gave firewood to the family of the dead for cremation on site. The inability to escape to be mobile is also intergenerational, as Leader explained. When I came at the age of 18, to the age of 18, they told me to sign my thumbprint on the debt contract in place of my parents. The debt keeps on increasing when I had a husband and children. In the future, my children will do the same, signing their thumbprint in my place. Hopefully, my children will go and work elsewhere, and I will stay here and wait for their money to pay off the debt. I can only leave this place once I've paid off all the debt. So brick kiln workers here are laboring under structural violences of intent, in which we argue capitalist accumulation compels their lives and bodies into both motion but also status to feed the country's appetite for bricks and city building, fueled by both domestic and international investment. The kiln renders workers and their families immobile then through the, debts, uh, through the bonds of debt, kinship, and we also argue climate change. So climate change is both an articulating factor in the move to the kilns, but it's also one that follows them. Bricks can't be left to dry um, outside, as they ordinarily are, for um, when it rains, for fear of degrading the quality of the bricks. So in these periods, work stops, and the mobile workers are forced to borrow increased amounts from kiln owners for their daily expenses before uh, obviously deepening their indebtedness. So climate change is exacerbating the material and subjective experience of unfreedom in forging periods of work insecurity. And research has certainly highlighted how rainfall patterns in Cambodia have become increasingly erratic due to climate change. So deepening uncertainty over rainfall is reproduced as precarity in the lives of brick workers. Cheer, a debt bonded worker, explained, the rain this year seems like it's different from the past. In the past years, the rain had its own months and seasons. For example, it was only raining for one to two months and stopped um, to rain for four to five months. For this year, mostly it has the storms and it's often raining. It's often raining, so I really can't work on the brick kiln. If there is no rain and storm, I could work continuously and have the money. The temporal shift in rainfall patterns engendered to some extent by climate change is captured in Cheer's palpable uncertainty over his income. And he clearly notes a change in levels of um, certainty or uncertainty, suggesting fixed patterns of rainfall are no longer discernible, um, and this is problematic for him. 
Yet it is Perset and Cheers adverse incorporation into the construction sector through an exploitative, unfree labour relation that renders them precarious. As I have spoken of, kiln owners profit from climate vagaries as they loan workers money for their daily expenses and thus ensures a reduction in overall debts remain difficult or even impossible. Figures from Ron Brickkiln offer a stark uh, portrayal of such profits. The total cost of producing one pallet of bricks, so this is 200,000 bricks, was uh, 3,300 US dollars, the labor constituting 21.1% of production costs. The pallet is sold at a rate of 8,000 US dollars, therefore gross profit comes to 4,684 US dollars, and labor costs make up just 8.8% of the sale price. Given the gross national income per capita, uh, which I quoted earlier, um, in 2016, kiln owners are shown to be deriving considerable profits through the exploitation of workers, deepened by the impacts of climate change and other aforementioned factors. So, in conclusion, uh, Cambodia's development over the past two decades has been one of huge growth. Natural resource stocks, however, have plummeted downwards, but all the while the urban environment has retained its upward thrust. The price of this altitude, though, is paid by those at the bottom. Market forces operating in the absence of enforced legal frameworks have seen the most vulnerable slip into inescapable debt, creating a pool of resources that have been greedily subsumed into the national project of construction. The very earth that thrust Cambodia's growth materially skywards, now baked quite literally into brick form, is that which once belonged to the disenfranchised and the now indebted. This then is the meaning of blood bricks, a material testament to vulnerabilities ratcheted up by the twin forces of market and climate, clawed from former farmlands by former farmers. Above all, uh, these dusty red bricks are a reminder of the earthbound quality of global forces. Development and environment are written on the body as they are written on the land. Okay, so um, can I just check the time? Um, I can, do I have time or not? Okay, okay. So in this final part of the talk, very quickly, I want to offer two reflections on the Sustainable Development Goals. First on Goal 8 and the second on Goal 13. Um, and I'm sure all of you are aware of what the Sustainable Development Goals are, so I will not go into detail. So they included for the first time Goal 8, entitled Decent Work and Economic Growth. A reference to modern slavery uh, was also new, um, and I quote, um, take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor, end modern slavery and human trafficking, and secure the prohibition and elimination of worse forms of child labor, including recruitment and use of child soldiers, and by 2025, end child labor in all its forms. Yet this sub-target, 8.7, comes after a first sub-target, 8.1, which is explicitly pro-growth, and another which highlights access to financial services as a key vehicle of growth-led development. As such, the drive to eradicate modern slavery is embedded with a specific conception of how this labor relation is linked to the wider economy. That is, modern slavery is seen to be marginalized from the market, and thus policies enabling inclusion and integration into growth markets are purported to offer a means to address it. So this seminar has explored a case of what could be described as modern slavery, uh, financial exclusion uh, through access to credit, uh, sorry, financial inclusion through access to credit, and economic growth that spans the rural urban divide in Cambodia. It has revealed that modern slavery is in fact engendered by the market and processes of financial inclusion when the poorest become incorporated in broader systems of growth do so adversely. Put simply, um, and this is something our current writing is trying to in interrogate, people become incorporated into market capitalism through relations that leave them worst off. So um, as Magister, Magister Scholar uh, Samuel Hickey and Andres Dutoit highlight in 2007, I quote, the concept of adverse incorporation captures the ways in which localized livelihood strategies are enabled and constrained by economic, social, and political relations over both time and space, in that they operate over lengthy periods and within cycles, and at multiple spatial levels, from local to global. These relations are driven by inequalities of power. 
The, Cap the Cambodian microfinance sector continues to receive laudatory comments for its developmental achievements. According to the World Bank in 2018, I quote, given its much smaller loan size and deep penetration into rural and remote areas, access to finance by the microcredit sector is crucial for supporting productive activity leading to poverty eradication. Conversely, Ananya Roy has termed uh, poverty capital what she describes as a, quote, a subprime frontier where development capital and finance capital merge and collaborate such that new subjects of development are identified and new territories of investment are opened up and consolidated. In this instance, the subprime frontier is poor smallholder farmers, rendered more subprime through the poor prospects for work in the Cambodian context. The brick kiln therefore offers a form of relative relief for families whose debts are continually rising as kiln owners purport to pay uh, MFIs and, local, and other local de debtors for an interest-free debt bond. So this is moving whole families to the kiln in exchange. So our research elaborates how workers continue to be adversely incorporated into broader circuits of capital and thus continue to be highly exploited through the terms of their work. So we hope therefore to contribute to a longer literature that highlights poverty as a relational concept, thus offering an implicit critique of approaches which understand poverty as the outcome of more marginalization from capitalism. Instead, our research foregrounds how capitalist growth in Cambodia engenders structural poverty, and in doing so, offers a critique of SDG 8 for its ideological fixation with economic inclusion as a means of forging decent work and eradicating modern slavery. We draw on a theorization of modern slavery, or rather unfree labor, where it is understood to be engendered through capitalist relations of production, rather than re representing an anathema to late-stage capitalist development. Thus, in seeking to end modern slavery, understood as a severe form of unfree labor relation, we would suggest that SDG 8 needs to jettison the attachment of GDP growth and link to this financial inclusion within its overall framing. By coupling, coupling growth with decent work and ending modern slavery, the SDG risks actively engendering forms of adverse incorporation as a developmental goal. And I think I'll probably, should I stop there? Because I'm, I'm not sure I've got time, have I? Um, yeah. I'm happy to stop, yeah. I was just going to talk about um, goal 13. Um, and I will stop there and say thank you for, for listening. And um, please do go to the website if you would like a copy of the report. It's been written for a non-academic audience and it tells 10 stories of um, modern slavery and climate change. And you have our Twitter account there as well. Thank you. Thank you.